Thank you, Ms. Boat. Uh, sorry, Basil, I'll see your message now. Hello. Uh, you cannot hear me. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry, thanks, Basil. I can't hear you. Let's try to fix that. Can you try now? No, I'll try to fix it. Oh, Hello. no, there you go. It's my, my problem, dude. My, my volume was just low. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, I think uh, let's get started. So this is an example of, uh, so today's lecture is super important. It's also the last lecture before, uh, or kind of that's gonna be covered in your test. So everything we've covered from the start of the course up to today is the test. Uh, in particular, a couple of the things we're gonna be going through uh, today, like the algorithms and the methods are, are important for the test and I do expect you to know them. Um, and then just as a, a general point, of admin next week after the, the lecture for like the last hour of the lecture time i'll be doing like a group consultation um and so anybody has it, i'll stop the recording if anybody has any like tutorials or anything that they want me to go through uh we can do that all together and just discuss and things like that cool but uh what i want to start with today is just a uh, a demonstration of something i've spoken about up to now and kind of alluded to but not ever made actually like fully explicit and that's the fact that there is a difference between a row vector and a column vector conceptually when we're talking and trying to think in terms of the geometry and so a vector is always going to be a column vector like what we have over here and again i apologize for the color the color issues uh on the projector it's all going to look like yellow and green but uh, yellow and blue but anyway so up at the top there, x is a vector. This x tilde is what we call a covector. All right, it's not a convector like uh, it says at the top. That's a typo. Covector, C-O dash V-E-C-T-O-R. And what a covector does, what a, a row vector does, is it tells us how to measure distance. All right. So it sounds a little bit like a basis, and that's kind of why when we spoke last week, we said that the basis helps you define an inner product. But what's going to happen when we take the product between a covector and a vector, so like I've done over there, is that the output will give us a particular value, right? So I'm just using the normal inner product here. And what that's going to tell us is how many of these lines this vector crosses, okay? And so you can see here that in what should be purple and what's coming out as blue on the board is a covector that I've drawn over here. All right, so down there, really small, there's your covector. And the reason it's pointing there is because that's at the point one, one, all right, on this kind of fuzzy Cartesian plane that we have. Okay, so all I did was I drew that vector. And then at every point along this plane, I then drew a line, all right? So because this was a one, one vector, I'm connecting the points one, one, two, two, three, three, and so on. So all just, you know, n times that I drew a, a kind of like a, a line here called a concentric circle. All right. And so what's going to then happen is when I take another vector like this green one over here, this seven three vector, you can see it's going up to three there and seven over there. What that's going to do is it's not going to tell me how many of these uh, concentric lines are being crossed. So if you count it's one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then there's the tenth one there which is why we come out to an inner product value of 10, okay? And that's the whole kind of point of these uh, kind of row vectors is they tell us how to define space, okay? Which is also then why we use them to give us an inner product. It's all it is is just saying, you know, how densely packed are these, are these vectors? And so we can look at another example down here where exact same vector in green, but now what I've got is a different covector which is half the size. And so when I use this dot product, it's now going to be five. And so you'll notice what that means is that I've drawn these um, concentric you know, lines or concentric circles, whatever, at a higher kind of, um, at a lower frequency, so at a, a higher gap between them. All right, and as a result now, when I count how many of these that this green vector crosses, it's five instead of 10, because I divided my co-vector by half, all right? And so covectors, if we're talking about kind of trying to consider change of bases and kind of all the things we've been speaking about, they go the opposite way to a normal vector. They behave opposite. 
all right? They get expanded when I divide by a half, all right? The, the, the jumps between them get expanded. That's not something we really need to focus on, but that is kind of the, if you are going really deep and trying to keep consistent with the, these intuitions, that's why it's called a co-vector. They, uh, they react oppositely to the how we define space. And you can also think when we're dealing with basis vectors and things like that, we'll usually write something like AX. You know what I mean? And we know that what this represents is a sum over the column space, uh, let's just sum of I, of A, right? So AI where that's the i column of A, right? We know that we're doing a linear combination of the columns of A, but you can then interpret what A is doing here in terms of the fact that they are also made of a bunch of uh, row vectors times by X, where each row is now telling us we're kind of behaving in this manner of tracking distances. Okay, and then obviously we discussed last week about how this A then gives us some. <clears throat> All right, just wanted to make that explicit. Um, that's kind of the geometric interpretation of a row vector. Uh, the natural thing that falls out from here is then if we have a covector that is orthogonal to X, so kind of pointing at 90 degrees to it, so I've drawn that here over there, then when we do the start product, we get to zero. Okay. And then if we look at how many of these lines this vector crosses of these red lines, because it is parallel to the covector, it crosses zero of them. All right. So this covector is telling us how many lines it intersects going that way. And so it's parallel. And so it intersects none of them. All right. We're all kind of comfortable with that and just kind of what a, a row vector is doing. Any questions on this? No? All right, not testable, just for intuition and an understanding of that difference. The second thing I wanted to show is a derivation of how we get to the um, angle calculation using an inner product. So we covered that last week. Um, you don't you need know, to cram this down. I'm not going to ask this proof. But it is a little bit... Um, Kind of in the weeds uh, and unintuitive, and I always find that calculation to be so. I mean, we went through, and this is the one I'm talking about here this, this value down there. So, you know, we went through the fact that what we can really do is kind of take in the, the norms into those two variables, and so you have like this normalized vector, and so the only distance between them is something that reflects angle. But uh, there's also a way to actually derive it, which I'm going to do now, and we'll hopefully just make it a little bit more concrete uh, and clear where it comes from. So to start off with, what we're going to be looking at is this A vector here. All right, so it has a position in X and Y over there, also reflected by the vector I call W. OK, so we've got the W vector over there, and we want to know what, um, what its angle is, theta over here with respect to V. OK. And so if I'm taking the X and Y coordinates of A here, we kind of firstly, we just do the usual high school thing of uh, dropping a perpendicular. So we have this kind of dotted line over there, which is 90 degrees to B. And as a result now, we know that we can just use trigonometry. And this is going to come up later in today's lecture as well. So this is also like a, a short reminder of trig. Okay. So we know that it's um, cos of theta is equal to X over R. Right, and so we're using that formula now. We just say that we know that x is equal to r cos theta. In this case, what r is is the length b. All right, okay, and that's over there. That's that is that length b, little, little lowercase b. Okay, and then same for y. We know that this point here we can get its projection onto the y axis over there using r sine theta. The radius is once again just this length b over there. Okay, and so we have b sine theta. That should be a kind of known way of writing this. And all we've really done is taken something that was in Cartesian coordinates and written it in polar coordinates. Okay, it's now defined by the radius and the angle. If I then wanted to get the norm of C here, right? So what I'm looking at is this, this distance between A and B. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this vector and subtract that vector, okay? Which is take A and subtract this V away, all right? 
And so V had a length of A along the X axis over there, all right? I've told you that there. And so it's V cos theta minus A, all right? Because V cos theta was our X coordinate minus A. And then v, this V vector had no Y dimensions, so that was just zero, okay? And so we want to get the norm of that, and we're just going to foil it out. So first I'm just going to square C so that I get rid of the, um, the square roots over there. And then I'm going to foil, foil out that multiplication and all that. This should be a negative over here, by the way. Okay, so that's a negative. You can see the negatives there. And then what that, that really gives me is this A squared value, which is just the square of the distance of V, because again, I've told you that V's distance is A. We then have the norm of W, because that squared, because that was V squared over there. And again, I've just told you that's the distance. Most of this is just plugging in constants that I've put in the diagram here. Minus, again, AB plugging in with constants cos theta. All right. So all we've done here is we switched to polar coordinates, and then I took the norm of this vector connecting V and uh, W. Okay, and then just did a little bit of pointing. But there is another way to write that norm of V minus W, right? Again, V minus W because it's that thing that we care about there for now. There's another way to write it, and that is just using this inner product, all right? So it's V minus W inner producted, but we know that we have the bilinearity of the inner product, and so we can foil all of this out, okay? There we go, I just wrote bilinearity so you can follow this when you're studying, if you study this. Um, and so we can foil all of this out, and what we get is the inner product of V minus inner product of V and W minus W and V plus inner product of W. And then we know that these two can be grouped together. You get minus inner product of V and W. But this is then the squared norm, right? Because we know that you can induce a norm by using square root of the inner product of V in itself. Not the best drawing. So then obviously, if I don't have the square root there, then it's just the same as squaring it. And that's what I've got there. Okay? Like that. And so I've now written this norm uh, in a product multiplication or the normal uh, calculation out in a second way. But we can now compare the two and say that, well, I have it written this way, and I have it written this way, and I can see that a bunch of these terms cancel out. All right, so I've written that just to put these down here. A bunch of these terms are going to cancel out, namely that's going to cancel with that, that's going to cancel with that. And so what I'm left with is because these are both the squared norm of V minus W, what I'm left with is the fact that this and this must just be equal. And so divide by two or negative two on both sides, and we get the fact that the norm of W times the norm of V times like cos theta is equal to the inner product of V and W. And that's written right here. And that is that whole calculation we went through last week of how to get to the angle. So it is a little bit of, you know, just plug and play, I guess. And it comes from the fact that we've just, you know, drawn this triangle here and it comes out visually when we draw the triangle. But uh, this obviously then generalizes into whatever dimensions you want and things like that. That's it. If you were concerned by that last week uh, and kind of felt unintuitive, he has another perspective of what's going on. He has another geometric representation of where this angle calculation comes from. All right, which so is two different ways of describing that. One is in polar coordinates, one is in just normal Euclidean coordinates. But from that, we can then just say, well, I know that that and that are equal. Okay. Cool. And that is all for today. Well, all for that example today. Uh, <laughs> guys got really happy. Um, and then this is just an example of what I said last week, where because of the bilinearity of the inner product, you can pull the norm of A up there and the norm of B in here, and you end up having just the normalized vectors being equal to cos theta. Okay, so that's just a reminder that. Okay, just a reminder that that's also a, another geometric interpretation of the angle. Um, that we can rely on. And again, a lot of maths, especially if you're trying to be intuitive about it, is just like knowing what perspective to take at what time. And so there's two perspectives that might be helpful. All right, anyone have any points to raise there? Are we good? Cool. 
All right, then we're going to go to the second part of analytic geometry today. Everyone online happy? We're good, sir. Great, that's here. Thank you. All right, so we've spoken a bit about change in dimensionality. And so more powerful machine learning approaches involve dimensionality changes. In the case of support vector machines, you work in a dimensionality typically higher than the original data. So if you guys have heard of the kernel trick, what that is is a way of representing infinite space or infinite dimensionality. Okay, so a lot of, okay, so I'll show you the kernel trick if you want, but that's an example that the support vector machine uses. Essentially, you project your data into an infinite dimensional space, and then we have what is actually going on at the top here. So if you have data that is crosses and dots, all right, and now this is not linearly separable, all right, there's no line that I can draw such that the X's are always on the other side of the line to the dots. Um, this is an issue. You can change how you represent the data. Obviously, if you're using radius, let's say, or like distance from zero here as a feature, that's a, that makes it separable. But another way to do this, especially if you want to keep things just like really linear and not work with like radius as a feature, um, is you can project it into high dimensional space. So for example, I've represented this by 3D here, but what you're really going to do with the kernel trick is you project it into an infinite dimensional space. And as a result, the data will now lie on two different parts of the of this infinite dimensional space and so you can put a plane between them that's the, the kind of high level idea of what the kernel trick's doing all right and there is interesting interestingly a way to do this with a neural network where you represent the neural network by its kind of input output gradient and it gives you a kernel and it's called the neural tangent kernel it's a big kind of way of doing theory and it turns out that it is very similar to how bird brains work, which is kind of cool. It treats uh, data like a, a shallow neural network rather than the deep one, um, which is kind of interesting. So it turns out that like, if you want to memorize something, this is an extremely good way of doing it. And birds memorize songs instantly, but what well, hummingbirds do. So very cool stuff. It turns out biologically, this is a reasonable way of approaching um, difficult data as well. But uh, for today, all we're going to be caring about is how to do normal projections in finite dimensional space. Uh, and so many visualizations require projecting down into a more manageable dimensionality. And that's kind of more of a direct applicable to, to, to today's lecture. So ideally, we want this mapping to preserve as much information from the original data as possible. There are often different aspects of the information we might, might prioritize. So for example, PCA, we try and preserve the variance. All right, and PCA is something we will touch on next week. All right, and then I just wrote a note here, data can be in high dimensional vector space, but may exist on a low dimensional manifold. And for now, we're gonna be assuming that the low dimensional manifold is linear. But uh, yeah, data in general is highly non-linear and exists in, a, it sits in high dimensional space, but it kind of sits on what's called a manifold. So manifold is any mathematical like space that is locally resembles Euclidean space, so locally resembles a flat line. Um, but in general, it's curved, okay? So that's a manifold. Data, for example, if you're looking at MNIST, obviously there you're representing digits by an 82 by 82 set of pixels. So that's sitting in a 512 dimensional space, but it turns out MNIST exists on an eight dimensional roughly manifold. People have tried to estimate it, where it's kind of like all digits are kind of only spanning eight directions in this 512 dimensional space, which is why it's really easy to classify those digits. All right, so ideas around dimensionality and things like that are going to start becoming more important. This is where ideas around uh, projections and transformations and null space and stuff are, are going to start becoming a little bit more applicable to like how you work with data. But here is a, an example in 2D where what we're doing is projecting onto a 1D space. 
Okay, so we have the blue dots, and those blue dots exist in a two-dimensional space, so R2. Uh, but what I really want to do is I want to project them down onto a one-dimensional line, all right? And that's this black line here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the shortest distance from each of these blue points onto the line, which is then the orange points, okay? And this is known as the orthogonal projection. Orthogonal because the shortest distance from this point to this line will be something that makes a 90 degree angle there. Okay, so the projection is orthogonal to the line that we're projecting onto. And very clearly, you can see that this is just a, a linear regression, right? We've now ignored at least this axis of information and we're just projecting or onto a one dimensional line. That's pretty much what linear regression is all about. So one thing I did just want to ask, and I do want you guys to help answer me on this. Um, so that says that's called an orthogonal projection. If we were going to model or, or talk about like modeling this data, the first question is if I want to model this data with linear regression, would I use a bias parameter? And secondly, it says does the purple basis vector define a vector or an affine space? Okay, so first one, if you're going to model this data with a linear regression, would you include a bias parameter? Yes. Okay. Um, how, but so the one important thing here is that it's crossing at zero, zero already. So, so yeah, maybe that's also the projector's not super clear with the red lines, but uh, over here is zero, zero. So that this kind of um, vector sitting over there is already crossing at zero, zero. All right. And so we wouldn't need a shift to make it an affine space. It is uh, a vector space to answer the second question already. No shift, no affine space, but also as a result, you won't include a bias parameter, all right? Uh, the bias parameter would come in if we needed to put a line that was sitting somewhere up there. And so we needed to shift our vector space away from zero to zero. All right, that's important. That's tying back how we model the data to the, uh, uh, to the things we've learned. All right, thank you for answering. Cool. And so that leads us to the general notion of a projection. So that was the orthogonal projection. There is a more general definition. And so it says, let V be a vector space and U is a sub subspace of V. A linear mapping denoted by pi is called a projection if pi squared is the same as just composing that function. So pi applied on top of itself. And it turns out it's the same as just applying it once. So what this means is that applying pi once is the same as applying it any number of times after that. Once we've done the projection, applying it again will do nothing to the data after that. All right, so that's the just flat out the definition we take that for granted. So since linear mapping can be ex expressed by transformation matrices, we can also express this projection as a with a matrix. All right, and in that case, then it's just um, the matrix multiplication a second time just does nothing. All right. And so what we're going to now look at is, again, the, a really important thing to track for today is how do we project something like this X vector onto a base vector B with the orthogonal projection. So what this isn't doing right now is changing bases or anything like that. This is a transformation now on the data or on the vector. Okay, so we have X, which is an element of Rn, and we want to project it onto a line, and it's a one-dimensional subspace, this line. Through the origin and defined by the basis vector B, where the span of B is just U. All right, so all the terminology we've covered. Specifically, when we project X onto the subspace U, we wish to obtain a vector that is in U, so on this orange line, that is as close as possible to X. And as I already said, we know that that's the orthogonal projection because that's just the one that's going to go straight down perpendicular onto the basis you're projecting onto. So it's going to make a perpendicular there. All right. So the orthogonality of the projection is just because this quickest projection of a point uh, onto the line directly to the line, which is, or, is always orthogonal uh, in direction. Okay, so I just said that. I'm not sure if grammatically that was great, but anyway, you guys get the picture. So we're trying to figure out that's the whole thing we're trying to do today. All right, it is, well, for the first part of today is just projecting onto this line at 90 degrees. Okay, so it is worth being precise about our requirements. The projection is closest to X when we minimize the norm, right? 
So that's the other way of kind of saying this is we just want to have the shortest distance from X onto the line. Again, we are minimizing this distance here. Okay. And that distance is just this norm of X minus X after I've projected it. Okay. So this is X after I've projected it here. This is X before. Okay, this occurs when the projection minus its original value is orthogonal to u. So this orthogonality means that the inner product between the projection minus x and the basis vector we're projecting onto must be zero. So again, this vector here is pi minus x or pi of x minus x. Okay, and then this vector there is uh, the b vector. And so what we're saying is this must be orthogonal to be all right and again i showed you this uh, example this more uh, or like two minutes ago where i derived that um, angle calculation we know that when the inner product is zero it means the two vectors are orthogonal okay we even saw that in the that example with the the row vectors and things like that when you have a row vector and it's orthogonal it means it's pointing kind of parallel to those planes that you were defining so what we really want to do here is again just find a way to minimize that distance and it just so happens that it's also where these two vectors are now orthogonal. And since the projection maps x into u, there is also some lambda such that after the projection, we can represent that vector by a linear combination of its basis vectors. But I've told you here that b is one dimensional. So we know that it's just one, one dimension. And so it's just one lambda over there. Okay. Is everyone comfortable with the setup of the problem? So there's a lot that we already know by what we've said. Okay. We're doing the smallest. We want to minimize the distance between X before and after the projection. We know that that would give us the orthogonal projection. All right. So we know then that this is true over there. And we know that after we've done the projection, we can represent this projected X as a linear combination of its basis vectors. Is everyone comfortable so far? Yes. Is lambda the number of the initial Lambda is that, co is that coefficient, right? So it tells us kind of how far along B we're sitting. Okay. So for example, this is this is our basis vector B, basis vector B here. So if I say that lambda is equal to 0 0.5, then we know that X is going to be a part of B, so it's going to sit there. Okay. So it's how we're defining this, this vector, right? And again, we, we've kind of covered that we know that we can represent any vector as a, a linear combination of its basis. So I've told you that I've projected onto this basis. I'm now representing it as just a, a line, uh, any kind of line along this basis vector. Okay. Yes. How do we know what the basis vectors are? It'll be told. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's kind of the whole point is that we know what basis we want to project onto. We're now figuring out how do we do that. Good question. Yeah. So that that is given, and so it's actually given. Okay. And so there's three steps to this process. I kind of find the second step to always be a little bit shaky, but anyway. Um, it's good to just be you know, thorough and we can get all the information we want out of this. So we are going to build pi, uh, uh, so P subscript pi. So we want to get that projection matrix that represents this transformation pi that maps any X onto U. And this is broken into three steps. So firstly, we're going to de determine that lambda. So we're going to determine the coordinate of our vector in this new basis we're projecting onto. Then we're going to determine what the full vector representation is. So again, we kind of know Know that what that really is is just lambda times b. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll say that's the second step. And then finally, we want to actually to use that to determine what this projection matrix was. All right. So this is the, the big question: is what was the matrix that would take us from here to here? Okay. And here's the steps, and you guys are going to have to do this. Uh, and I just wrote another way of, you know, thinking about this a little bit more geometrically. So the first is transform into the basis P and find the coordinate vector. Then you use that to represent the actual vector that's being projected. And then after that, you just determine the projection matrix. But uh, again, that's more of a, a note just for studying. Okay, I know this looks hairy because I've scribbled all over it, but it's more just because I felt like putting all the information possible, the derivation of the size did skip a few steps. So firstly, what we're going to... Uh, what we're going to look at is, well, we know that we want the orthogonal projection, okay? And just to note that on the previous slide, uh, this pi was coming first, so it was uh, pi of x minus x first, 
here it's x minus pi of x. So up here, I've just shown you that uh, it's the exact same thing. And it comes from the linearity of the inner product again. So for example, if that's the order we started with, I could pull out the negative out front here. All right, and so we have x minus pi of x. Those two are now uh, swapped. And then I just divide both sides by minus one and you still just end up with zero on the right and then now they're uh, swapped. Okay, so it's because it's being this inner product is equal to zero, you can just swap the ordering of these two things. But uh, if that just made, you know, that, that's just, uh, I want it to be explicit that that's why it's swapped there, it's because you just can. Okay, all right, so we know we're starting with X and we know we're projecting onto X. We don't know how this projection happens yet. So we're leaving a general over there. We're just denoting it by pi. But we know that we are going to project x somehow, okay? And when we do, it's going to be orthogonal to the basis vector we're projecting onto. And so I know that once I've projected it onto a basis vector, it can be written as a linear combination of that basis vector. Again, we're in 1D, so lambda is just a scalar telling us how far along that basis vector we, we're running, okay? And then from the bilinearity of the inner product again, which to be general, if you remember the bilinearity thing, it's, that just gets used over and over and over in these proofs. Uh, we know that we can actually break this up and foil it out. So it's going to be x times b first over there. And then the second term is going to be minus lambda b times b here. And that's how we get that. All right, again, skipping a couple, a couple steps, but I think the bilinearity stuff should be kind of clicking in your heads now. And when you study, you can kind of just have a, a check of that definition there. Um, and so this is where we start. So that's uh, the kind of first thing we want to get to. And now all we're doing is just rearranging to get this lambda, right? Because again, what we want to do to start off with is get that coordinate vector. We're starting with this, just the term of lambda, okay? And so I'm going to take this over to the left-hand side. So instead of the, having the zero there, and then divide by the inner product of B on both sides. So I get that lambda is equal to the inner product of X divided by the inner product of B, okay? And just to say, we know for a fact that the inner product of B is greater than zero, uh, for any B that's not, not equal to zero, all right, by definition, all right, from that, that's the definition last week of an inner product. So we know that we're not going to be dividing by zero or doing anything pretty, pretty bizarre. And obviously, if B was equal to zero, then we're projecting onto nothing, right? If this vector was the zero vector, there's nothing to project onto, so that would be ridiculous. So that's kind of the only break point of this calculation is that B equal to zero, which is a good one. It just indicates that you've done something unreasonable. Okay, and then over here now, what we're going to do is just represent this inner product B as the square of its norm. Okay, so just to remind us of that, the norm of B is equal to the inner product square rooted. And so if I square both sides, I just get uh, the inner product of B. So we, again, we're using this inner product to induce a norm. Okay, everyone happy with how I get up to there so far? Okay, a little bit of just gymnastics. Oh. Do we always square root it even if it's not a plus product? The inner product is something else. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because in that case, and it's a good question, I would actually recommend going through this process for a general inner product, but all of that is going to be inside here. Okay, because we're still at the end of the day just going to end up with inner product B, B. That inner product is just going to look something more like uh, B times by A or B transpose times by A. Yeah. yeah, good question. But for now, and kind of in general, we do these with the you know with the dog product because this is just a it becomes a bit of a big mess to do on by hand, and I don't really care that you can do matrix multiplication. I'm sure you guys can. Um, in some cases, I do ask you to do general inner products, but I try not to do it for like this. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, and so now what we want to do is we want to just find that lambda. So we've essentially found it. So if we use our current context and choose the inner product to be the dot product for convenience, then using the dot product, we can obtain lambda as this. Okay, so there we go. And don't forget that the inner product in general, the, I'm using the dot product for example here, and kind of, you know, I will tell you to use that. But in general, when we're dealing with actual data, it depends on what basis we're working in. All right, remember the basis tells us how to define the inner product because we would have something like a times x 
And then when we're doing the inner product of this, you would end up with x transpose, a transpose, a transpose x. Where this multiplication there is that basis, is, sorry, is that kind of metric or whatever. Um, but we covered that two weeks ago, so I'm not going to go back into that. But uh, I do just want you to remember that, like, we're, in general, if you're given data and you know that it's sitting on a, a more useful basis other than Euclidean space, then you just need to keep consistent when you do these things. All right. Um, and again, how we choose what basis we're working in, I'll show you a, a helpful basis next week. There's usually like one or two that are particularly useful, all right, and particularly meaningful. In principal components analysis, we know that it's the eigenbasis, which I'll cover. But um, you know, in terms of if you're ever going to be arbitrarily choosing a basis, I, I don't know. It takes a lot of knowledge to choose that. Let's say um, it takes something like knowing how neural networks represented to define a kernel for it, or something like that. So these bases that we work in, that there aren't like infinitely many. You know, usually we have one or two that we know are meaningful and work, and that's about it. All right. And then last thing just to note is obviously if B here is unit norm. Uh, so it's norm is equal to one, then that just becomes one. And so lambda is equal to just the inner product between B and X, which makes a lot of sense based on that diagram I showed you at the start, because B is defining how those, how closely packed those concentric circles are. X is telling us how many of those circles we cross, or so those lines we cross. And so that is actually just going to give us a single value representing the line in terms of that. Place. Okay, geometrically, this is kind of making at least a bit of intuitive sense, I hope based on that, that kind of earlier picture. Cool. All right, and then for the next bit, and again, this is the part where it gets a little bit, not unnecessary, but it's kind of, um, uh, I think conceptually is the, maybe less helpful. So we've now found the coordinate vector for X in terms of our 1D basis, all right? So now all we really need to do, if we want to represent the actual vector itself, is just say, well, lambda times b. All right? It's my coordinates in terms of that basis vector times by the basis vector. It gives me that actual like line on the ground. If you remember when we were talking about the, the kind of line on the ground and measuring with uh, kilometers or meters, it was a thousand meters or a hundred or one kilometer. All right? That was always the coordinate times by the measure. And it's just coordinates times by the measure up top there. All right. And that will now tell us how to describe the actual line that we've now projected. How do you actually, what does X actually look like after I've applied this projection? Okay. And so we take this lambda and we multiply it by B. And then over here, I'm just going to um, substitute in the definition for lambda we calculated on the. All right. So that was this over there. Or at least where we kept the general, it was this over there with the inner product up top. Okay. And so we have this inner product up top divided by the uh, norm of B times by B coming from there. And then from there, we can just again use the fact that the inner product is the dot product up top. So that's all that's actually happened now is that's the projected X. If what we care about then is the norm of X after the projection, we know that the norm when you're multiplying by scalar. It's just the norm of the basis times by the absolute value of the scalar. I uh, did that proof two weeks ago. Uh, you can look it up if that doesn't ring a bell, but that's just a, an identity that we, we've established and gone through. So if the dot product is used, we can tie in our earlier angle definition as well. All right, so again, that's kind of also why I went through that to begin with today. Um, what we're going to then say is, well, we know that the this norm of the projection over there is kind of equal to all of this on the right, plus the norm. And so we're going to substitute in this fact there. Okay. So we're going to then just multiply it on both sides by the norm of B and the norm of X and substitute that all in. We get this term here. Okay. Everybody kind of somewhat comfortable so far. So what I'm applying is this there. That's all I'm trying to really work with. Knowing that fact, I take over the norm of the B and the norm of X to the other side of the cos. Okay, I get this term there, and I substitute that in at the numerator. All right, we'll see how I'm doing this. Okay, I've got that entire term up top there that's now being subbed in there. 
And I'm just going to actually write it out. So what we've done on the next line is we've grouped those two terms over there and then everything else coming from here like that. All right. Okay, that's where we're at now. And then after that, we realize that we just have the normal B, normal B, normal B squared, that all cancels. And we're left with the angle, angle denoted by omega, not theta anymore, times by the norm of X. So what this means, and what's quite interesting, is that this, the length of our vector after we've projected it is equal to the length of the vector before we've projected it times by cos of the angle that, of that projection. All right? So what this note over there says is, and I want you guys to again think about this now, what happens if omega is zero? So cos of zero is one. So I'm looking for the, the interpretation. What does it mean here if cos of zero equals to one over there? Yes. X is already on the direction. There we go. We got it. They were parallel, right? X was already pointing in the direction of the basis vector. The projection did absolutely nothing to X, and so parallel. If it's orthogonal, okay, so if the angle is 90 degrees, cos of 90 is zero, okay, that means we've now projected X. 90 degrees onto its basis, and so it has no length. Okay? In that geometric sense, what we did is we had an X that was pointing up that way. And so once we've projected it, it's now sitting like that. That has no length. Okay? So zero. So it makes a lot of sense that uh, it's the angle before, then proportional to what was the angle of this projection. How much did we, of that length, got lost when we projected down? And then lastly, we want to now answer that question of what was this projection matrix that actually takes the data from the original space onto my projection. This is the thing we really, really care about, right? Getting that lambda representation is just a step along the way. Um, and this is kind of now the, the, big, the big thing we really wanted. So firstly, since the projection is a linear mapping and our domain and co-domain are finite dimensional vector spaces, there has to exist a matrix that can do this projection. Okay, that's a little bit wordy, but all that's saying is we know that this is going to be possible to solve. And so using the dot product, we can make the following observation. So firstly, this happens just because it's 1D, but um, you can swap around the scalar multiplication with your vector. Okay, then we're going to substitute in that equation that we got for lambda. Again, just to be clear, it is this, not that. It is this that we're now substituting in. Okay, so that goes in there, and we have B on the left, and then we just group these two terms up top here first, okay? And that's because matrix multiplication, or you know, as a more general concept, or vector multiplication, is associative. And that's one of the important things of why we care about defining these things earlier, is now we can say it's associative. I know I can change the order of multiplication from doing B, X first, to now doing B, B, transpo B transposed first, and then doing x after. All right, so I can rewrite it as this with the x out front. And so now recall that b is an n by one matrix and b transpose is a one by n matrix. Therefore, b, b transpose is an n by n matrix. And I've just drawn that out here in 2D. Okay, so this would be b, this would be b transpose. And so we get a square matrix representing this projection onto our 1D line. Okay? Um, it's also symmetric, that's kind of given, and so it follows that now if we wanted this projection, it's actually just this term here, by definition, right? Because this is the term which takes x and gives me pi of x. Okay, and so that's the projection matrix there. Uh, as a quick question, what is the rank of that matrix over here? Okay, so the rank is how many dimensions the matrix projects onto. Mm -hmm. It is one. Okay, and it's because I've told you that we're projecting onto the one dimensional line. Okay, 
we are projecting onto that line there. So even though we have a two by two matrix, the matrix itself is taking something and putting it onto one dimensions. All right. Well, we said that the rank was equal to the dimension of the image of the matrix. Okay. So the image of this matrix, we just solved this projection pi. So let me actually just write pi in there so it's clear what we're doing. Okay, so we have the dimension of the image of pi. Okay, the image of pi, it's what pi projects onto. It is the 1D line. And so the dimension of that, that line, this basis vector line, is one dimension. All right. So what this means is that we know that the, the, there's this kernel nullity theorem and all of that saying that we have to still kind of equate everything to the big space, which is R2 in this case. And so if this is one dimension and we're sitting in R2, then we know that the kernel of that projection is also one dimension. Okay. So if we're trying to kind of tie all of these ideas back and try and kind of keep coherence about what the kernel nullity theorem is saying and that sort of thing, this is a good example of what's going on. We have a, we're good. We are not good. We're coming up for a break now anyway, guys, so don't worry too much, but uh, okay. I guess we're taking a break now then. Um, can I see you guys back at 20 past three? represent any space in the Okay. So my basic vectors there are along to this form. Um, and so when we talk about what we can span, it's how many dimensions we can reach using those basis vectors. Okay. So if I have a basis vector pointing that way, and another basis vector is half the length pointing the exact same way. If I add these two things together, you can still only point that way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, two of them, and that's their linearly dependent. Okay, I can represent this vector. If they're, you know, not that, if there's an angle between them, then I can represent two of these And they span two. So in this case, I've told you that our basis vector is 1D. So we're representing only one direction, which is B. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, 
I will, yeah, that'll be helpful. Uh, let's grab you. How have you been going the last few days? Um, I was sorting out my access and everything. So it's the first lecture that I've been Oh, I see. Okay. All right. And you just, in general, feeling okay? But what's admin is not going to make you feel too positive, is it? Well, I'll see how I get catching up with the class and how I feel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, reach out. Um, you, have you seen? Oh, you obviously not in the middle. The, on the course outline, there is a link to a Discord page. The Discord um, has like a ticketing system. Pop open a ticket there if you need anything and we can chat. Uh, what is your number? 292. 8948. 292 So just uh, have a look here and check for me that's. Two nine two eight nine four eight. Yeah, that's okay. So you're you're not a Moodle yet, so okay. that'll happen the next day or so. Okay. What I can do for now. Um, do you want to? Are the recordings on? Yeah. The recordings are on well and on YouTube, so I can email email that to you. Yeah. I'm more concerned how you're going to get like the notes and stuff like that. Okay. Um, let's pop open Outlook quickly. You can give me your email address. Yeah. Right. My this email or my email. Or, a, or a personal email, and I'll just send you what I got so far. Yeah. Oh, wait, you have been emailing me, right? We, we yes, obviously chatted. I have been emailing you. So what is it? Uh, what's... Uh, M-A-I. M-A-I. S-A-I. Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, cool. Great. Uh, let me do that. M-F-D-S. All right. When we finish just now, I will kind of put that together. And then you mentioned how I need to get the project supervisor as soon as possible. Where do I, who do I go to for that? Um, so you need to start your capstone, this capstone project. So again, that's um, done by, um, uh, yeah, Dr. Robertson would be the first person to chat to about that and just see what she says. No worries. <laughs>
As far as tests and things like that coming up are concerned, it's crazy. And two more modules in the same week. To be fair, you guys had a vote on the test date. That is only like half on me. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get that. That's not fun. Why the same the same week? Because some course ends semester ends the following week, right? It's just the fact that it ends not on a Friday, so that just got lost us today. Um, is it mainly kind of that last few days of semester that you guys have tests? Yeah. Everyone else, come side guys. Did the applied maths people sit on the right and the comms guys sit on the left? Did we, do we like match? <laughs> the yeah, 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 okay. And the? <laughs> hmm. Okay, so I mean, yeah, like I, I am genuinely, you know, concerned though, like how, how your project's looking and things like that at the moment. Labs is just a lot. Okay. All right then, okay. Well, I'll do my best to be available on, on Discord then if anyone wants to tell me a time when things are busy for you or when you're likely to be doing tutorials in advance, I can then, you know, try to prepare to be available for you. So let me know. All right, then I think we can uh, get, slowly get back started. I see we have two minutes left. Um, anybody have anything to bring up based on what we've been doing? Okay, still, still probably feeling like a lot. Uh, I'm hoping, you know, what usually does just happen in this course, it feels like, you know, four weeks of information. And then when you get down to studying, what you realize is that it's four weeks of repetitive information. And so we've been going over like rank nullity theorem a couple times and uh, things like that. So hopefully these ideas are starting to set in. And we start to get a little bit of intuition for it. And then, yeah, you guys will like study in your types and, and those sorts of things. And uh, it'll then become a little bit clearer. Um, good job. Anyway, that's, uh, that's that. Um, sure. All right, then I'm going to get started if there's nothing else. Um, so what I was doing before the guys online, are we, can you hear me? Are we happy? Cool. Thank you, Basil. Um, so what I was doing just before this is just going through the intuition of what we've done. So what we've done is we've solved for a projection and this projection pi takes us from a vector in R2. So you can see there that we're sitting in some 2D space here by those two black vectors. It takes us from R2 and will project us onto a one-dimensional space spanned by this B vector, okay? So spanning meaning that we can reach any point along this B vector using it as that basis. So any lambda B for some real number B will sit along this line, okay? And what does that is this projection pi, okay? And that will take X and project onto lambda B. And I was just trying to then relate this to the ideas we, we had when we were talking a little bit more abstractly about transformations and stuff like that, the most important of which being kernel and nullity and melt space. And so the dimension of a matrix, call it pi here, that projects from one data space onto another is by definition the image of pi. So the image is what points we can reach after this projection. And I've told you that it's a linear combination of B. So we can only reach lambda B. Okay, that's the image of pi. And then the dimension of lambda pi is one dimensional, all right, because it's sitting on this line. Okay. So that's the dimension. But then we have what's also called the null space or the kernel of A, all right, or the kernel of pi, this projection matrix. And that is the di dimension that gets left behind that we cannot represent after using pi. And what that is, is this dimension there. It is that one that is orthogonal to our basis, right? Because we've now lost that information, I can't tell you, let's say I had a second x that was sitting up there, right? And this is x prime. I can't tell you whether or not, looking at this point, I can't tell you whether or not it was x or x prime, because in both cases, I projected down onto the same point there. I have lost that information. That is the null space of pi, okay? And as you can see, that also spans a line, right? That is also this 1D perpendicular line there. And so that's the dimension of the null space, okay? 
and we know that the dimension of the null space plus the dimension of the image is equal to the original space we were in. So we have one dimension of the image, one dimension of the null space, which matches R2, which is where we started. Okay, so this is the curve of nullity theorem done in what like kind of two dimensions. And why we care about the fact that there is a null space is because I told you at the beginning that the definition of a projection is that I can apply it twice. Okay, so what's happened is the first time I apply pi onto x, I have lost this information about what I, or where I sit along that direction. Once I've done that once, that information has gone. You can't lose it twice. So if I then apply pi a second time, nothing's going to happen. There's nothing, no projection to be made. It's just I take x from where it started over here. I project it onto the line. And then the second time I project it onto the line, it just stays here. All right, it stays on the image of pi because it's already sitting on the image of pi. The same thing came up when I was talking to you about the angle here. All right, and we noted that over here that when cos was zero, the angle between the two was zero. I was already sitting on that line. Okay, the same thing. We've now just already, we were already just sitting along the image of the projection. Okay, so that's kernel nullity theorem, that's projections, uh, that's pretty much all. Summarizing one little image here. Yeah. Everybody comfortable with those ideas? Very comfortable. We don't have to be experts in it, but we, we're kind of getting the geometric in intuition of what a kernel is and why we care. You know, why we why we care what information is lost, which tells it is you know defined by the kernel space or the null space. Okay. So then just to recap, the pr process to actually find that projection was to do pretty much this, so this lambda. So if I want to find P here, the first thing to do is get the lambda. And we know that it's the orthogonal projection. So we're just going to run through all of that calculus, just boiling out using the bilinearity of the dot product or the inner product. And we get to an equation of lambda. After that, if I wanted the actual vector, right, it's just coordinates times by basis over here. All right, so that gives us that equation. And then lastly, the last important one is if I wanted the actual projection, it's then just rearranging it, what we got came to on that last slide, all right, it's regrouping terms. And that's it, that's the, the, the formula. So that's the formula for any case where we've used the dot product as the inner product. It's not always gonna be exactly that, when we use a general inner product, because you know, you're know you gonna have all the like, you know, general brackets and matrices and stuff if you insert in, but the process is the same, all right? And then lastly, we just spoke about the fact that this is the final matrix that we get here, will be a two by two matrix, but again, we are projecting onto, uh, we're projecting onto this line. And so the image of that matrix is 1D, one dimensional, it's a rank one matrix. Okay. Again, we the reason we care about the rank of the matrix is because that tells us how much information we can keep. We, it's a rank one matrix acting on 2D space. We know we're going to lose one dimension of information. There's nothing we can do. Cool. Okay. So the projections we have been working with produce a vector in Rn. However, we no longer require n coordinates to represent the projection, but only a single one if we want to express it with respect to a single basis vector. And that's larger why we would do this, right? Is that instead of having now a vector or representing information in terms of one dimension, or sorry, two dimensions like here, we projected it onto a line. And so we can just represent this data now using the lambda and knowing the basis vector that we, we had, right? So that's what this point says here. Okay, so it says the number of coordinates and basis vectors, you need changes, and it's not the dimension of the space the data is sitting in. So it's still sitting in the 2D space, but you can represent it now in terms of this basis vector that you've projected onto, right? We know that. But hopefully that's a lower dimensional basis. And so you can now compress your representation. On the flip side, it may be the case that what you've done is, you know, you've lost that second dimension, right? There was that dimension that sat in the null space, but they, that may have just been noise, right? So linear regression, this is usually what happens, is you try and 
keep the most important bit of the signal and project onto that, and you lose the parts of the, the representation that are noise. All right, PCA does this. You, you kind of always project onto the most important covariant, covariant vector, lose the noise vectors. Okay, so the fact that we're losing information by projecting is not always necessarily a bad thing. What matters is what the null space of the kernel represents, what the image represents. Okay, and again, you are going to be expected to do that in tests and exams. So now I want to generalize from projecting onto a one-dimensional subspace, align to an arbitrary lower dimensional space with the dimension of u being greater than one. So here's an illustration for a projection onto a 2D space. So in this case, we're sitting in 3D. All right, we have this x vector sitting in 3D there. But the same idea holds. What we want to do is find the orthogonal projection onto this plane represented by u. And the way that that works, the way that that works is we jump on the accordion. The way that works is you just obviously do the orthogonal projection. We know this, so this is going to be 90 degrees. Okay, and so you can see that this red vector here is orthogonal to the plane we're projecting onto. Exact same idea as we just covered in 2D onto a 1D projection. So we're going to say assume that we have a set of ordered bases, B1 to Bm. Okay, and in this case, we have M of them. So the dimension of the space we're projecting onto is M dimensions. Okay, and we know that any X element of Rn that uh, has a projection uh, of the projection can be represented as a linear combination of these bases, vectors. So in the last case, we had lambda times B because I told you it was a one basis vector. We're projecting onto one B space. In this case now, it's M vectors and so we're going to be a linear combination of the m vectors. So now we have m lambdas. Okay? All right, and those lambdas, again, are our coordinates with respect to this basis. And the same uh, three-step procedure holds. So we want to find the coordinates of the projection such that uh, it sits on that linear combination. All right? Um, and we want to do it so that this projection of x is the closest possible point of view to x. That's where they're orthogonal. This occurs where, yeah, the projection minus x is orthogonal to u, which implies that it must be orthogonal separately to all basis vectors. And that's important, right? So it means the fact that it's orthogonal to the space, come on, the fact that it's orthogonal to the entire space means that it's orthogonal to all of the basis vectors individually. Okay? And so remember now that when defining orthogonality with respect to subspace, we mean a vector is orthogonal to all vectors in the space and by extension all basis vectors that it spans. Okay? And that's then exactly what we're going to do. All right? Is we're going to take our, uh, our vector, and again, they've been swapped here because of the bilinearity and all that. So we're going to take this, that projection vector, that x minus pi x, and we're going to check that it's orthogonal to all m of our basis vectors. And if we're using the dot products, it corresponds to that. So b1 transposed times by the, the difference vector. And so ultimately, we can then just start to package this together in a matrix form, which makes it easy to write, uh, which corresponds to this. All right? So firstly, it is the fact that it's x minus the projection of x. We know that the projection of x is a linear combination of our basis vectors. So we have capital B times lambda, lambda being the coordinates. Okay, and then it says in the previous slide, B was on the right, but the inner product is symmetric. So we can switch the arguments to avoid transposing the bigger term. That's just if anyone's getting confused about switching terms and stuff. But it's just because inner products can be switched like that, and all, all, all that stuff we've covered. What's important is that we're now currently checking that this uh, vector before and after, after the projection is orthogonal to all of our bases separately. And we're now going to just package this into one big matrix multiplication. Okay? So what we had on this previous slide was this vector transpose, this vector transpose, uh, multiply by all that. And so if we wanted to package it, then we're just going to put it in a vector here, where it's each of those uh, vectors making up a row of that vector, of that matrix. Okay? And then just still doing the exact same matrix multiplication. I'm kind of trusting that this part is at least, you know, how do you take m row vectors and stack them so that they give you a matrix is at least somewhat intuitive. But please stop me if that's not, if that's, you know, a slowing point. 
Okay. And so what we have now is an n by n matrix over here, multiplied by n by one matrix there. And so we're going to get an n by one uh, as an output, which is great. And so when we do this whole matrix multiplication, we can foil that out. And we just do the exact same thing we did the first time around, except with matrices now. So we have B transpose times by B times by lambda on the left, and then B transpose X. And then the last time what we ended up having when it was 1D was we just had this norm squared of B over here, but we can't have that anymore because this is now a matrix. And so we have this inverse instead. Okay, same as just dividing the now matrix version. Okay, and so equation 25 is called the normal equation. And note that B transpose times by B is invertible because by definition, B1 through M are linearly independent. I've told you they're a basis. And so we know that they're linearly independent. And we know that when we do this multiplication, you're going to get a matrix that is full rank in the sense that it represents M dimensional space. All right. Okay. So this means that we can solve for lambda just by doing this inverse. And again, that's exactly what we wanted. That was the whole point of that first. Well, when we did this in 1D space, it was the exact same process. We've now just done it in matrix notation, so it's happening for every basis of vector at the same time. And then just makes it slightly more difficult to do the inverse. But that's it. Nothing else has really changed conceptually. And the same thing then when we want to get the actual projection, because this is the coordinate vector in terms of this basis. If we want to get x actually in terms of that, uh, and kind of represented in that space, then you just multiply again by B, all right? So we've got lambda over here. That then gives us this, these elements of lambda there. And then the BI is all just your original basis vectors. You can also do it in the matrix version like that. Cool, and we substitute that in and we have the same equation as last time. All right, so again, last time it was just B, B transposed divided by the norm of B squared. But hopefully you can see that, you know, that's very clearly the same thing. All right, and then lastly, if you want to find the projection vector, well, we know that the projection vector is, sorry, the projection matrix. The projection matrix is the matrix which takes X and maps it onto pi of X. And so we can see that that is actually just that matrix there. And so we read it off and we just say, well, there it is. Okay, so you've already got it at that point. Cool, and so that's the whole process of doing this in high dimensions. All right, again, assuming an inner product, that is the dot product. Um, but again, we've assumed that here on this previous slide, okay, where we wrote that. So if you weren't, if you're having a general inner product, then this would then be, you know, there'd be like an A matrix or something in there. But again, that just becomes messy and conceptually doesn't change anything. It's just how you represent in space. All right. And Okay, so that's now the whole point is that we've now re-represented those vectors instead of with n coordinates, it's now m. M can usually be significantly smaller than n. Right? So if n is, you know, again, I use the example of the handwritten digits called MNIST in machine learning. Um, that's usually 512 pixels, so 512 dimensional space. Uh, that can usually be represented by like eight coordinates because it's sitting on the AP space. All right, so after you know some manipulation. Um, and so you can compress and re-represent information a lot more succinctly this way. Okay, and if we're projecting onto an orthonormal basis, so again, this is for a general basis, but we covered the fact that when we have an orthogonal matrix or an orthonormal basis, what it means is that all of those basis vectors, the columns, are orthogonal to each other. So bi times bj is zero, and then bi, is, bi squared is equal to one. 
right? It's own in a, the inner product of itself is equal to one, it's got a unit name. That's called orthonormal basis. And so if that's true, if that's what we're working with here, then this term in the middle becomes the identity matrix. Okay? And the inverse of the identity matrix is just the identity matrix. And so what it can actually be simplified to is just B times B tra transpose times X. And so if you have an orthonormal basis, you don't have to go through the really expensive part of this projection, which is doing the inverse of B transpose B. As much as we know that that inverse exists, because the vectors are then um, linearly independent, if they're orthogonal, we can use that information to actually just completely bypass that calculation and do it a lot more efficiently. And then recall that if we had a system of inhomogeneous equations, so again, something with a B on the right hand side here, but it had no solution, it means that B is not in the span of A, right? Okay, because what we're doing is we're finding X, the linear combination of the columns of A, okay, so the linear combination coming from the values of X, which represent B. But if when we get, get this into um, reduced row echelon form, you've got a row of zeros, but then in the augmented matrix, something that wasn't zero, so you've got like zero, zero, and then a value there, that's now a contradiction, all right? And I, when we went through that process, what we said is that, but we can get close, and we um, kind of showed you the pseudo inverse and all of that. What that actually amounted to was that equation over there. And what you'll realize now is that equation is the orthogonal projection. So that equation is the one that gets us as close as possible to representing B, uh, even though B was outside of the space we could represent. Okay, it's the exact same thing. That's only in the case where B was outside of the space of the, of the column space of A. All right? So that's another example of what kind of tying these things together. Okay, so just to read what the point is, but we can try and find the X, which is in the span of A closest to B, as an approximate solution, specifically, we can try to solve for that, where x, if it exists, is the least squares solution. So again, you would have heard of least squares from statistics and things like that, because this is also the linear regression solution. Okay? That's exactly what linear regression is doing. It's projecting your data down onto the um, kind of closest representation you can, can for that data, putting it with the closest line possible, the line being x in that case. Okay, so we need A transpose times A to exist, but when it's a basis, we know that it's true. Um, and so you can see that, uh, see this as us projecting B into the A basis, such that we get the elements in the span of A that is as close to B as possible, i.e. the orthogonal projection. So just, yeah, one thing to notice is that in general, that A transposed A wasn't always linearly independent, and then, you, you know, you had those issues with invertibility. But uh, in the case that we've just gone through now, when A was actually basis vectors, then again, you do know that it exists. But uh, those are minor points. In general, what, what I want to know is that when a solution doesn't exist, we can use the orthogonal projections to get the closest possible one that does. Okay. So that's the, uh, that's orthogonal projections. And again, a really big part of all this, uh, and kind of a lot of tying a lot of these ideas we've covered in the first few weeks together, is everyone very comfortable with what we've gone through. Okay. Yes. When you find the X, uh, the norm, when you say that um, it's cos omega, it's cos w, norm of X, is that w even between? Yeah, yeah, that's omega. It could also have been theta, yeah. That would have been the, yes, exactly. Correct. Good. All right. So what we're going to go through now is a process called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So it uses this idea of a projection that we've just gone through. So working with an orthonormal basis comes with many advantages. We just saw this example here. Okay. So the first step in a lot of processes, if you have to ever do a really heavy projection like this, what might be better is to start off with orthogonalizing and orthonormalizing your uh, basis vectors instead. It's the kind of thing that is probably going to make a huge difference if you like actually work in real data. And it's the kind of thing people aren't going to think of. 
because we don't kind of understand and we're not thinking in terms of basis vectors and things like that. So if you're given a bunch of data, trying to figure out the orthonormal basis might be the best way to start so that you don't have to do an inverse of an n by n matrix. Okay? So if we have an ordered basis D1 through Bn of an n-dimensional vector space V, the question is, is there an equivalent orthonormal basis? Furthermore, can we build the orthonormal basis from the basis we start with? And the answer to both is obviously yes. We know we can do a change of basis. Um, and so now the answer, there's always an orthonormal basis represented by the U's that sits in the span of our original basis, all right? So again, you're not changing what you can represent. The new basis is still in the span of the old basis, bless you, but uh, it's just now a change of representation so that it's orthonormal so that like heavy computations can be avoided. And so the, answer, the, the second question is also yes, and it's known as Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. And this works, I'm going to show you another example of this, because if you follow the, the way the slides go through this, uh, it becomes messy, because you have to do a, a matrix vector calculation. There's a way to do this that it becomes vector vector. So I'll show you that at the end, but just to go through the slides, this is the way you're going to do it. So Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization constructs an orthonormal basis, orthogonal basis, U1 to Un, from the original basis represented by the Bs. And the first thing to start off with is you just say that the first vector, U1, is equal to the first B vector, by definition. Then every vector that comes after that, okay, 2 through N, is going to be equal to the corresponding B vector minus that B vector projected onto the basis we've already represented. Okay? You can see here that it's being projected onto the span of U1 through K minus 1. All right, and there is a picture of what this is doing now. But what this is really doing is separating out this new basis vector U into what is parallel and perpendicular to uh, what came before. All right? So by dropping what was within the span of what came before, I know that what I'm left with is just the vector that is perpendicular to the previous basis I've already worked with. Okay? It's the only, it's a vector that's representing only new information. Okay? So let's dive into equation 38. So the kth basis vector BK is projected onto the subspace span by the first K minus 1 constructed orthogonal vectors U1 through K minus 1. This is then subtracted from BK and yields your new vector, which is again orthogonal then to all of what came before. All right? And then you're going to repeat this for all the n basis vectors, yielding your orthogonal basis. And then lastly, you want to go a step further, which is to normalize it, right? So you get U hat, which, and the way you uh, normalize the vector is divide by its norm. Okay? What this will then give you is the fact that the norm of the new vector is length one. Okay? So UK here won't necessarily have B length one, but when we divide by its own norm and use that to define a new vector, then that new vector's norm is going to be equal to one. We did kind of go through that as well. So here's an example of what's going on in 2D space. So I have two basis vectors, B1 and B2, but you can, and so they span R2, all right? But you can see that they are not orthogonal, right? They're not... 90 degrees to each other, there is a maybe 45 degree or whatever angle between them. So as much as they're a basis, in the sense that they are a minimal spanning set, minimal, there's two of them, spanning, you can reach all of R squared through some combination of those two, they're not orthogonal, nor are they normal. And so we might want to get to an ortho, uh, orthonormal basis. And so the first thing you're going to do is just say, well, U1 is equal to B1. Okay, that's pretty arbitrary. So I'm just going to start off by defining that to be the same. All right, so there you have your B1 was originally that, and now in blue, your U1 is identical. But after that, what we're going to do is we're going to take B2 and project it onto U1. All right, so we're taking our new basis, or you know, that, that next part of the basis we're working on, and projecting it onto what came before, and then subtracting it from B2. So we're now going to take that orange vector, which is that projection of B2 onto U1, and subtract it from B2, so that we move that way. And that gives us U2, which is our new, our second new basis vector there. Can everyone see what's going on here? Yes. Um, 
Oh, because we've done that uh, projection. Because so it can what we are subtracting can only move parallel to that vector there. Okay, which would then give us that. We all happy? Okay, so now we have our two new basis vectors u1 and u2. You can see that they are 90 degrees to each other. And all that happened was we took v1 and used that to subtract only the information that's parallel to, B, to u1 from v2. And so we were left then with only the part of v2 that is perpendicular to v1. All right, and then after that, now we've changed the length or you know done whatever to u2. We might then want to renormalize so it's unit length, and so you divide by its own norm. So that's just a, a final step. That's the gram schmidt process. You just run through that repeatedly for every single one of your, your vectors. But what's important to remember is you have to do that for all of them. So if I have three basis vectors, I'm going to start off by saying u1 is equal to v1. Then I'm going to do v u2 is equal to v2 minus this projection. And then after that, to do u3, I'm going to say u3 is equal to v3 minus the projection onto u1 minus the projection onto u2. Don't forget to do all of the ones that came before that. Okay. Uh, sorry, there was a note there. Let me just make sure I'm covering that. Like you or not. It says here, note this algorithm works for any inner product, so make sure you use the appropriate inner, pro inner product normalization step as well. So that's also kind of important. So when you do when you do this this process, what you're going to end up getting to is then you want to normalize. And so you've used an inner pro a general inner product, say like this, which is then equal to B transpose A B. You know, we've got the general inner product with A being some matrix there. You're then going to get to a point where you want to normalize. Uh, and so you're going to end up going U is equal to B divided by the norm of B. When you do this, don't use the dot product. You've got to still use the same inner product all the time. All right, that's an easy mistake to make. Again, I don't love giving you kind of big inner products to solve in general, but uh, if I'm giving you a 2D Grand Schmidt process, there you might get a, um, a general inner product. So you do need to know how to do this in general. Okay, and again, don't make that mistake where you use a different inner product, um, a different inner product for the normalization step that's just going to be completely wrong. Cool. Everyone happy with Gram Schmidt? Okay. So then we can also think about projections onto affine spaces. So we've been going through vector spaces, obviously there, because zero is an element of the, the basis that we're working in. But now we might want to do this in general for affine spaces. In particular, in this case, this is where like you have a data that is consistently shifted away from zero. So if you're doing linear regression, you now will have a, uh, a um, bias parameter, okay? And that's going to then represent your affine space because of the bias parameter. So until now, we have been restricting, restricted to projecting on vector spaces. Can we extend our approach to affine spaces? So in this case, we are then taking this vector x and projecting it onto the subspace L, where L is sitting in a 2D plane, all right, so if, as if it was represented by B1 and B2, but now shifted off slightly by X0. Okay, affine space, vector space, B1, B0, shifted by a support point is the terminology we used last week, which was X0. Okay, and the way you do this is to actually just always go from the affine space, remove the shift. Work in a vector space, put the shift back. So let L be represented by the vector space U plus the shift. So we have vector space U over there plus a shift by the purple vector. Wait, sorry. Going the wrong way. So we have U uh, plus the shift. We have F1 vector space where X0 is the support vector and 0 is the vector subspace of V spanned by the basis V1 and V2 as I've drawn. We want to find the orthogonal projection onto L of X. X is in V, so V is the general three-dimensional space in this case. 
In order to do this, we transform our problem into an easier context to perform the projection and then undo that original projection. So consider the point x minus x zero and let L be equal and let u be equal to L minus that support point. All right. All I've done here is I've taken this shaded region and shifted it back down so that it touches at zero, zero. So it is now a vector space again. All right. And that gives us our vector space U. You can see it over there. And we already know how to project X onto U, specifically just using that orthogonal projection we've covered. And so we can now just take this and do its normal projection. Okay. So all we did was take the original X, subtract X naught from it. Okay. And then do this projection down onto this basis here. So there's kind of two steps. There's the shift, then the projection down. And that's what the, this kind of sequence of slides, uh, sequence of slides are showing. You can see the, the shifted orange point there doing the orthogonal projection onto our gray region. Okay, and so remember x minus x zero needs to be in V for you to be a vector space, which we know it is. Cool, and so all that is left to do now is we've done this orthogonal projection, all right, we've taken x, we shifted it down to account for the, the affine shift, we did the projection onto the vector space, now what we need to do is shift the space back up. And so we add back that x zero point. So the only, uh, we only need to add the support vector back leading to this being the entire transformation over there. Okay. And one thing just to note is if, again, if we want to be good data scientists or whatever, and we're trying to do this efficiently, in most cases, it's best to foil this out and do the subtraction in the, um, in the like projected space. Again, because we know the projected space is going to be lower dimension. You don't want to be doing a whole bunch of high dimensional subtractions if you don't need to. But we know we have to do the matrix multiplication anyway. And then that matrix multiplication is also super parallelizable. Cool. And that's how we do all of this with affine spaces. Okay. That's that should be pretty clear. You just shift down, get a vector space, do the projection, shift back up. Everyone happy with that? Guys in line, are we still you still with me? I see we did lose someone. All good. All right. Thank you. Cool. The last thing we need to go through today then is um, rotations and what that represents. So this is just more of a, um, hopefully a little bit an easier bit. So those two things, Gram Schmidt and orthogonal projections are really important for this chapter and understanding geometrically what it's doing, understanding how the projection matrix ties in with like rank and null space, things like that, uh, all important stuff. Um, so now we're going to look at rotation matrices. So rotation is an automorphism, which means that it just maps from a vector space onto that exact same vector space. It's the same dimension. And in our context, we is typically just the Euclidean vector space, and we're going to stick to that. So we typically discuss the rotation in terms of angle theta around an axis. The angle theta refers to the counterclockwise movement, all right? So it's always that way. All right, so if we have some original data set represented by this cube, so there's if you zoomed in on this, there's a whole bunch of little dots here where the color represents kind of what, uh, what index the data point is in. Uh, then we're going to try and take this entire square data set here and just rotate it by uh, 112.5 degrees. And so how do we represent rotations? Well, because it's an automorphism, because we know that it's going from V to B, what this really is is a change of basis. Okay. And so we're going to follow the change of basis process we went through two weeks ago. So we have the standard coordinate system R2 with the corresponding basis E1 and E2. So we're in the canonical basis to start. So uh, the one zero vector and the zero one vector to begin with. How can we rotate each of these vectors by theta as seen in the diagram below? All right. So here is our initial points. And then what we want to do is now rotate to that. Okay, the, that new kind of blue, it is blue on our side, because blue were uh, basis vectors. And what we're doing is rotating by theta. Okay, so we know, again, I went through this kind of earlier as well, 
positive theta is equal to x over r. So we know then that uh, we can just do that multiplication of r out there, right? But in this case, that radius is just one, okay? And so this just simplifies to being sine of theta and cos of theta, okay? So that then ends up being our new way of representing the space. Okay, so if we wanted to represent, uh, okay, so let's say we know that our new basis vector is that minus sine theta and cos theta, and this is cos theta and sine theta, then we're going to go through the same process we went through with the change of basis, right? And so we know that that was to start with E1 and E2, which is our old basis. You then want to represent uh, your new basis in terms of your old basis. So we're representing E1 in terms of 1 and 0 and 0, 1, and E2 in terms of 1, 0, and 0, 1. And then you just take that, you take your coefficients, and you stack them in a matrix. Okay? Just remember the ordering of how you do this because it's cos goes there and then this minus sign comes in the top right. Again, we went through that in the, the one note and just how to package it into a matrix properly. But that's what we're doing here. Okay? And so, and so if we have this, uh, the, the whole point then that we're doing here is we're taking this basis vector there and we're saying, well, we know that if it's theta, then along the x axis, it's just cos of theta there to drop down. And along the y axis, it's just sine of theta, right? The slightly more tricky one is if we're representing this vector using polar coordinates, then this is essentially our x axis, that's essentially our y. And so then it is to get the projection down onto there. We know that it is cos theta, but that is in the direction of the second basis vector. So it comes in there. Right, so that it's over there being multiplied by our second basis vector. And then for this projection here, that is kind of effectively, if this is our angle, this is effectively our y. So we know that it is sine of theta, but we can see that that is in the direction of the negative of the first basis vector, which is that way. And so now we have the coefficient being sine of theta. All right, so we're just taking these blue vectors and rewriting them in terms of the black vectors, which we started with, which is exactly exactly that process we went through two weeks ago. You just need to be a little bit careful of how you're doing the sine causes and things like that. But it's not, I don't think that's, you know, super tricky. Um, it is mainly the case where you're just noting that that is lying in the negative direction of our first basis vector. So it has to be a negative sign. Okay. And so if we're going to then take the two vectors, form a new basis with it, and package that into our transformation, we know that what we're going to get is that forward transformation matrix, which is this. Okay? And if any of you do robotics, I'm sure by now you've seen the kinematics equations, it's just that. Okay? So this is exactly what we're doing when we're doing the kinematics as well. It's just multiplying by the rotation matrix. This is essentially how you derive it, how you think about it in terms of linear algebra. It is that change of basis. Okay? And I just wrote it out here at the bottom in terms of the way we usually do it as well. And then this just says, be careful of that phi notation because the textbook can get a little bit tricky with it. Um, so this again, keep your, uh, keep your wits about you when you're doing these forward backward transforms. Are you dealing with bases? Are you dealing with coordinates? And so on. We've been through that, but just don't get kind of too in the mud with the uh, with that fine notation. All right, so then just the one other thing to note is that um, if you take E1 and you project it, then this is what you're going to get. You're going to get cos squared times plus sine squared of that angle. But we know that that's an identity that always adds to 1. And so square root 1 is 1. And so all this is really showing up top here is that rotation matrices are not going to change the length of a vector that you apply it to. All right. Everyone happy with this? Rotate. It's a little bit more intuitive, I, I hope. But um, think about it in terms of the change of basis is how you're going to define the rotation matrix or derive the rotation matrix. Um, rather than I think in, in most other places, it's just kind of given. Um, so when we move to R3, we can rotate any two-dimensional plane about one-dimensional axis, for which there are three choices. All right? The easiest way to specify the general rotation matrix is to specify how the images of the standard E1, E2, E3 are supposed to be rotated while ensuring that 
each of them after the rotation remains orthogonal to each other. A lot of wordy stuff, but all we're really doing there is picking one dimension to fix and rotating around that one. So if we're fixing the E3 um, uh, representation E3, then what we're doing is rotating E1 and E2, okay? Which gives us uh, probably that, yeah, the rotation on the E3 axis. And you can see that, that what essentially has happened is we've just put one over there. So that when we're multiplying out of, by a vector over here, that one is just multiplying with what would be along that Z axis. So we're not changing Z, we're only rotating the first two dimensions, which is just by the normal rotation matrix we just derived. Okay? Same for any other two. Um, you just fix one of them, rotate around uh, the other two um, di dimensions or axes. Okay, and then we can make this even more general and define the Gibbons matrix. Okay, so generalization of rotations from 2D and 3D to n dimensional Euclidean vector space can be derived by the exact same pattern of just fixing n minus two dimensions, and then you restrict the rotation to a two dimensional plane in that n dimensional space, which is exactly what we've been doing, right? We restricted the, e, the E3 direction rotated in the two others. Now you're going to have multiple of these other dimensions, all right? If you're in any dimension space, it's n minus two that you don't change. You, they just have ones in that matrix. And then you just have your cos and sines for two dimensions at a time, <coughs> all right? And so this rotation of two dimensions at a time in n dimensional space is called a Gibbons rotation, but other do, others do exist. And this is the general form of it, all right? So all you're going to have is identity matrices uh, along the diagonal. So identity is just all on the diagonal. Zeros everywhere else, except for four different elements corresponding to the two different coordinates, which are in the pattern of cos theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta. Okay? And that's it. That's the transformation. And we know that when we define it with uh, a rotation around the i and j dimensions, then we're going to have r i i because so that's that that's what there, then r j j because, and then the uh, i j ones of sine and minus sine respectively. Cool. So that is just a general form of the given rotation, but at the end of the day, it is just still that same intuition of what we were doing here, just fixing one of the dimensions. So in this example in particular, we were fixing e three, for example. Okay. So rotations have a number of useful properties which follow from them being orthogonal matrices. Rotations preserve distance, they preserve angle. And that said, rotation matrices are still not generally commutative in three or more dimensions, so the order of application must be considered. Okay, commutativity meaning that you can't do, uh, uh, again, we've gone through that, but it can't be A times B, X is not equal to B, A, X. All right, if that's true, then it's called commutative and matrix multiplication we know is not commutative. All right, the other one that people get generally confused with is associativity, which is A, B first, then times by C, X. Okay, so again, this is associativity. So A times B first, then times by C is the same as B times by C first, then times by A. Um, that's associativity, and then this is commutativity. So again, we don't really need the X's. So that would say that A times B is equal to B times A. That is not true of matrices. Please don't do that. Cool. 
Um, but yeah, so anyway, that's um, rotation matrices, preserves distance, preserves angles. That's an important property, and that's because it's a change of basis. It kind of also has very particular properties of like, you know, cos and sine have identities and stuff, which kind of keep everything in proportion. All right, so it's just kind of keeping vectors the same uh, length. The last thing I wanted to go through was an example of doing the gram schmidt process. All right, so I will leave it to you guys, and I think I know the answer you're going to say. You want to take a five minute break before we do the example? Do you want to push through? Guys in line, we good? Cool. All right, thank you. Okay, so the reason I want to also show you this example is just because um, I don't like doing the matrix multiplication the order that the um, text says you should, because you end up getting bi times bi transpose. And that gives you an n by a matrix that you then multiply by x. You just don't want to be doing matrix multiplication by hand any more than you are, than you have to. So there's a way to do this that does the exact same thing, but it's a little bit easier. And this is the equation that I use. So the projection of B onto U is defined by first taking the dot product or the inner product, if you want to be general, of U and V, then taking the inner product of U with itself, all right? That will give you a scalar. This fraction here gives you a scalar that you then use to multiply u by. Okay, and that's the projection. And as you can see, what you're doing is vector, 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 getting a scalar, then multiplying by a vector. So at no point are you going to get like pop out with that, uh, that like a matrix or something. Okay. All right, and then we're going to follow gram schmidts process. So first things first, you just say u1 is equal to v1 by definition. All right, so what we're doing here is we're taking a, um, a basis v, converting it to the orthonormal basis u. So u1 is equal to v1. And please don't forget to normalize. In fact, if you normalize now, it usually gets a bit easier. It's not always the case. It depends on like fractions and all that stuff. But usually it is a good idea to normalize right now once you've just got this vector. Because now you know that E1 is unit length. Okay, then from there, we're going to then just take again U2 is equal to V2, but now we need to remove V2 being projected onto what we already have. So that's V2 projected onto U1 using this up there. Okay, so now what we're going to have is V2 over there, and then the U1, 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 and U1. Okay. So let's try to keep track of which vector is being projected and which vector is being projected onto. Okay, U, we are projected onto U and we are projecting V. Okay, and then lastly now, if we have N of these vectors, we need to then subtract that projection of VN onto all of the previous ones we've already done and subtract that so what we're left with is just the orthogonal part of Vn that is orthogonal to all of the previous base effects. All right? And so let's say, for example, we're going to start with that. So we have V1 and V2 there. Okay? So to start off with, we have up top here, U1 by definition equal to V1. Okay? And then if you wanted to normalize that over there, you just divide by the norm, and I'm using the, inner pro the dot product as my inner product here, so it keeps it a little bit easier. Uh, so in that case, now what we're going to do is we're going to take u u1, okay, two over three, two and three, and divide by that norm over there. Okay, so I can just zoom in a little bit. So we do the dot product. That's two by two by two, three times three, gives me square root of thirteen overall, and that then multiplies by two three. That is now E1. Okay? And our first vector. The next thing we're going to do is now take define U2. So we're going to take V2 over there, 1, 1, and subtract from it the projection of V1 onto V2. All right? Using this formula up top there. So start off by taking the inner product between V2 and U1 there. Divide by the inner product of U1. Fortunately, we already did kind of all that over there anyway. So there will be a lot of reuse. Times by U1. Okay, so we already got U1 up top there. 
V2 has been given. So you just do that multiplication and then the multiplication of U1 with itself there. We've now got a scalar, okay? That scalar tells us what proportion of uh, U1 we are removing from V2 to get to U2, all right? So that's the, the kind of change in idea is you're now removing a part of your previous basis rather than doing it the forward kind of way of thinking at least. And that's it. that then gives us our new uh, equation over there. And then please don't forget to divide uh, U2 hat or whatever, uh, yeah, by its own norm. So norm of U2 over there. All right, and that's just what we're doing over there. I'm not gonna go through that. You guys can check the maths on it. But uh, yeah, we just divide by its own norm using the inner product. Please don't forget the square roots. It is a norm, not just the inner product there. For this projection, it's just the inner product. So please remember the difference between a norm and an inner product. And also when you're doing distance calculations, please remember to do X minus Y. If I ask you for the distance between X and Y, there's a difference. Norm is X and X, distance is X minus Y. Um, you'll be surprised from you and whatever. It happens a lot. Please don't do it. All right, and that's it. And so now what we have, if we predicted, if we looked at this basis transformed by this process, what we have now is our two new basis vectors, which you can see are orthogonal over there. Orthogonal, and if you really, in a test and you want to check that things are as they should be, you can take the dot product between our two new vectors and double check that that gives you zero. Okay, because they're orthogonal, they have to give you zero. Okay, this is how I would follow through on a question like this. Um, and then the last thing, just to point out how this relates to what was done in the slides. So in the slides, we were using the projection formula there. Uh, and so if you substituted this into those slides, what you would end up getting is a two by three there and a two by three there. And so now you've got a matrix and you're trying to take into account the size of that matrix over there. So it just becomes messy. You're welcome to do it this way if you want. When I write a memo, I do both. Um, but yeah, I would recommend you don't do the way that gives you a two by two matrix over there or an N by N matrix over there. But you can see if you follow through on this, you come out to the exact same answer that I got. Um, and all that we're really doing is instead of using that equation at the top there, the B, B transpose equation, what I'm instead doing is taking out the B and doing this X transpose or B transpose X first. All right. And then after that, because I know that this entire thing will give me a um, scalar, I can then just change the order that I do this and I pull it out front so you get the B, uh, that second B is sitting there. So all it is is just associativity of dot products. I know that something gives me a scalar, so then I can change the order of multiplication. Just a, an easy manipulation that just makes your life easier here. Everyone happy with this example, particularly what I've shown you on the left-hand side of this um, with how to actually run through this process? Cool. All right, that's all for today. If no one has any other questions. Anything to bring up for your test yet? In the test, will we, look, will we be looking at projections into n-dimensional subspaces or just on to that? I can't remember what I said now. In general, you could be asked to do into n dimensionals. I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to ask you to do like five dimensions by hand. It's, uh, I try to be reasonable. Um, again, it's also like I, your test is written, but I know you have computers. You're all applied maths and computer scientists. I know you can do matrix multiplication with NumPy. That's not what I'm testing here. I'm testing that you understand the geometry and what's going on. Unfortunately, doing this process is a part of that. But uh, I don't. I try not to tax the matrix multiplication, let's say, or whatever. But um, one thing I will say is sometimes there's easy ways to do things, and I check that you know that. Like, do you understand the maths well enough to make your life easy? For example, do you do it the way that gives you a scalar rather than a matrix and stuff like that? That's important to me. That's what makes you good data scientists uh, and things like that. Someone is that? Oh no, that's my email. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think we only look out for like ways to, you know, make life easy for yourself in those cases. Use what you know, use your understanding of 
whatever definitions we've done to try and kind of manipulate the problem if you have to. Cool. All right, everyone happy? All right, I'll see you guys next week.